Not sure what happened there, but uh, hello and welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to a another episode of Man Buns and Jesus. Uh, we are the Man Buns. Jesus is the Jesus, obviously. Uh, Jesus, so so eloquent and well spoken. Thanks. Uh, I am Pastor Ben Olschlager here in Lake Orion, Michigan. With me, as always, uh, I don't know if it's unfortunately for you or for me, is Josh Laborious, pastor. We're partners in misery. <laughs> Scum of the earth, uh, maggot flesh bags, or whatever Luther would call us. Um, Gross. Hopefully not that one. I think he, I think that was pretty similar to something he wrote at some point. Anyway. Uh, with me is Josh Laborious, pastor at Edgewater Lutheran Church in Eastvale, California. And uh, today we're uh, side questing again because we felt like going on a rant and both of us need to blow off a little steam. So uh, here's what we're going to rant about. We're taking a look at, at the qualifications and, and the formation process required to, to lead God's people and specifically to lead them um, in what we call the pastoral office or the office of ministry. And uh, here's the probably the, the best synopsis we have for those qualifications from scripture in First Timothy, First Timothy 3. Man, I can't talk today. Uh, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, Respectable, hospitable, able to teach, excuse me, just ate my lunch, a little gassy here. Uh, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well uh, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So, Josh, I kind of spoiled most of what we're talking about today, but you want to give the people some specifics? Yeah, so for those of you listening and you're like, I hope you're still listening. I hope you didn't duck out immediately. Um, we are going to be talking about kind of what goes into making a well, specifically an LCMS pastor. Um, and you might say, well, what does that have to do with me? It, a couple things. Um, first is, if there are young people in your life who are considering this path or um, you think should consider this path, right? This is, this is valuable kind of uh, valuable material for you to chew on. So if you're looking at encouraging them, you have some things to kind of think about how uh, you might go about that. Or if they're thinking about the, you. Uh, we're right? just getting the who you should send this podcast to part out of, out oh, of the way right yeah, off the I bat here today. So. Um, but it also might give you some valuable questions to ask them. Um, and if you're listening to this and you're considering ministry, I, I would encourage you to take it pretty seriously. I mean... We're not experts, but we, we're as knowledgeable as the average person, I guess. Um, and so we are more knowledgeable than your average bear. That's true. Yeah, because we've been through it. Um, and for what it's worth, you know, I my congregation, we have a CMC vicar right now, okay. which we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, my my dad went through the SMP program. And then we uh, we both went through the residential program at St. Louis. And we're friends with other SMP pastors, other pastors who've done other routes. Um, I was pastored by a guy in college who um, came to the Lutheran Church uh, after jumping over from the dark side that is Methodism. So um, we've got we've got a variety of backgrounds that we can kind of draw on. Uh, and hopefully help give you a bit of perspective on like, this is where your pastors might be coming from. So, yeah. And, and Ben brings up a good point in that 
it's also it's good for you to know where we come from and kind of where we're at because it explains at least some of how we go about things because how we go about things might be different from what you would uh maybe think would be uh the natural way to do things or something um so i think a good way you to can start never fully explain the inner mind of the ben or the josh that's uh the task that is impossible to mortal minds well at very least to sane unbroken minds but you know <laughs> um and i'm torn on where to start so i'm just gonna start shooting and ben you can corral me do you, do you want me to reel you in a little bit and then push you and then you can start shooting well i i had two thoughts and <laughs> as is testament to our planning i think one place to start might be to just talk about where what these different programs are and then the other place to go would be um why do we care what goes into making a pastor i think let's start there and talk about some of that first and then circle back to the program because then like the programs so, make more sense if you know yes why so like for example josh and i as we were prepping for today's show kind of gave a rundown of like here are the different ways we think that our process of becoming pastors formed us um one academically um it's school it is absolutely school. And two, two, go ahead, go ahead. Two, um, like maturity and relationally, um, how do you act? How are you with people? Um, like, can you walk into a, a hospital room of somebody who is um, on their last legs and say things that are appropriate? Um, that was a big piece of it. And then the last one, um, and was one that historically the seminaries have been pretty bad at from my, but, um, sorry, I don't know why my camera keeps dying, but, uh, that is growing in like faith actually yeah. having yeah. spiritual maturity um the the irony about those seminaries being bad at that i was warned by my my home pastor as i um as i like nope that's worse sorry i should stop messing with my camera settings during a podcast um I was warned by my home pastor before I, I went to seminary. The hardest thing about this is going to be your spiritual life. Um, Which for the residential program is on some level understandable, right? Because if you're spending all of your time writing in-depth exegetical papers, like staring at scripture through that lens, it's really hard to kind of step back and look at it devotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which explains a little bit of why the spiritual growth is such a difficult thing at the SEM. Um, but kind of stepping into those three, the reason we care is part of this comes from the, the Timothy passage that Ben read in a little bit ago in that, and, and this is something that is pretty consistent whenever scripture is talking about leaders in a spiritual sense is they are called to be examples. They, they are held to a higher standard. Um, so you, you need, when, when you're talking about a pastor, you need someone who has that understanding of the theology of the scripture so that when people have questions about what we believe together, someone can at least get close to an answer or, or know where to look for an answer. Um, you need someone who, who can lead um, and be that demonstration of like, here is what a spiritually mature Christian looks like, right? These are some of the things that are, are critically important for pastors. And 
you know, I, I say the longer I've been out, but, you know, in my whole two years of ministry, I think especially that the character formation, the character of a pastor and this and the spiritual maturity, I think is maybe more important than anything else, because I think modeling is maybe the most important way to teach and to disciple, which is a whole separate podcast. But, um, and the other, the other reason, like it kind of matters what goes into making a pastor uh, is the breadth of what we do in this, in this vocation, in this job. Um, and a lot of people don't see it. Well, they don't see all of it, right? Uh, if you say you're just, you know, a middle-aged adult, you go to church on Sunday, you go to a Bible class sometime during the week, like that's what you see. You don't see the counseling. You don't see the youth programs. You don't see the staff meetings. You don't see the times of devotion where, where your pastor is walking with people. Because like a lot of what our job is, is private. It's between the pastor and then one or two or a group of people. Um, and that stuff doesn't get seen as much, but it really, really matters the character and, and the capability of the, the men doing that. Um, so even if you say, well, really, they just need to be able to preach well and, and know a little bit about the Bible, lead a Bible class. It's like, no, <laughs> they need to be able to counsel. They need to know how to deal with people who are facing, uh, who, are, who have lost a loved one, who are struggling with different things. And I, I'm not by any means saying pastors are, are like, are full-blown counselors, right? We, we know when to refer to someone who that is their main job. But on some level, like these are skill sets that are, you, you need to know how to organize and how to cast a vision. And like, uh, there, there are a lot of jobs, uh, roles that a pastor fills. So it really matters who you put in that role. I made the joke last week about uh, our guest, Jim Marriott, wearing a lot of hats and me being surprised he still has hair. But like the the reality is for most pastors, that's kind of a, a thing on a weekly basis. Um, like Josh was mentioning, we go from leading worship, um, preaching, teaching through the liturgy or working through the liturgy. Uh, teaching on the scriptures in in sermons and Bible studies to, um, you know, counseling somebody that, that needs spiritual care uh, to organizing attendance and signups for VBS to um, right now I'm in the process of uh, both creating new promotional postcards that we can send to our local chamber of commerce and looking at our website again, which is atrocious. Um, and like all of that is kind of in my purview somewhere. Um, and so to be able to. <laughs> There's a reason that this uh, profession has one of the highest rates of burnout. Mm-hmm of any of any like line career in the world uh yeah. i don't know if pastors are still number one but they're pretty far up that list yeah um, and like i know of uh i have an aunt who's attends a small church in, in the pittsburgh area um and she talks about one of her favorite pastors was the one who also knew how to fix plumbing and hvac issues um and he saved the church a considerable amount of money by doing a lot of those repairs himself and that's the reality of a lot of the smallest churches in the united states like pastors wear hats that you would never expect them to wear i'm not necessarily wearing those hats here i have you know thankfully volunteers uh, that can take care of a lot of that and um we have just enough budget to cover the rest of it um but like Spirit, spiritual maturity is important because you need to be able to to lead people in faith but like your knowledge is also important 
because you never know what you're going to run into. Like being able to have a relatively broad and uh, in some places fairly extensive and deep knowledge of, of scripture and theology, it's important. Um, and then just being able to not be a jerk, hashtag episode one. Um, hashtag episode one. Uh, if that one hasn't been remastered yet, you should do it. I'm pro- we you reference it, it all the time. Yeah. Um, um, but all of this is to say, and I'm saying this not just to write, right? I, I'm going to make a point with it later. So hold on to this one. This is a very hard job. And it's kind of like it's compounded by the fact that you are most pastors do not have much of a support system in that you get called in a lot of cases away from family. So you don't have family nearby. You get called away from your other pastor friends. Uh, You're probably not near any friends you had prior to that. So you're kind of out on your own. And then the difficulty is even the people you grow close to in a congregation, you are still their pastor. So like it is not appropriate for you to go and complain to them about work. (laughs) Right. So like you're facing that. And the reason I bring that up is because all of that, and I'm segueing, so I hope you didn't have too much more of that. You have to take all of that in mind and you say, how do we prepare men to do that? How do we prepare men to be able to answer those questions, to walk in those in those roles, and to handle all that without a whole lot of support? Um, and in our denomination, there, there really are, there are three primary, well, we'll call it four primary ways to do that. Um, the first and most uh, popular, I got graduating the most pastors is the traditional residential route. Okay, so this, uh, this means you finish your undergraduate degree. Um, Some people do uh, an undergrad degree in theology or philosophy. Ben did one in civil engineering. Uh, Mine was in education and mathematics. Um, But so you get your undergrad degree. degree, And then you go to school for four more years, right? So you spend two years at the seminary taking classes, and those classes currently... Uh, at least in St. Louis, are divided into practical classes, which are like leadership and mission, and stuff like that. Um, preaching, I think, is practical. You have exegetical classes, which are study scripture. Know what's the background, what's the language, what's the culture. You have systematic classes, which are how do we put all these pieces together into a larger body of theology. And then you have historical theology, which is what have we done with this in the past? Right. Um, so you go for two years and then you take a one year vicarage. So you'll you get assigned to a church somewhere in the country and you work as a pastoral intern for a year, essentially. Um, and your experience really depends on what church you end up at and who is the supervising pastor. For example, Josh went to Mouth of Rats, Florida. Um uh, that's a Boca Raton for those of you who don't translate English to Spanish easily. Uh, yeah, I went down there uh, to Palm Beach County, which is the, well, I don't know if it still is. It was the most unchurched county in the country. And I went to St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. I learned from Steve Coretto and Andrew Kubowitz um, and, and the whole team there. But those were the two pastors who were there. Um and I, I really, I got to see some incredible ministry and I got to learn a lot. Uh, ben, were you at somewhere in Nebraska or something? I was in Nebraska. I specifically asked for anywhere but the Midwest and got sent to Nebraska. Um, but I also, like the rest of everything else that I was looking for in a church was um, found at that 
that church in Nebraska, um, that it was a, a church plant, a place doing a lot of like experimental things and um, just trying to find their footing in the world. Um, that was a really cool experience for me too. I uh, learned under Pastor Justin Bell, AKA Buzz, uh, for any older pastors that are listening to this. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a really good learning experience for me too. Um, not everybody has a great learning experience over their vicarage. I think Josh and I got lucky. Uh, I, I think you're correct. So you do your vicarage and then you go back to school for one more year to kind of consolidate what you saw in vicarage. You, you have a lot of classes that talk about what happened, like what would you do differently? What did you see that you think is worth kind of holding on to and repeating um, some stuff like that? And then they send you out. So that's the residential route. Uh, that's the traditional route. And within that, there's like, there's also the residential alternative route. With really ancient recruits. Yeah. It, it like self titled. It moves. It, it's, it's it very moves a little a quicker similar because it's... program. You still go to St. Louis for a few years yeah. and then you get sent somewhere. Um, so it's specifically there... designed for guys who are a little older. Um, and oftentimes who have, experience you know leading in a church congregation um but different than something we're going to talk about in a minute oftentimes these guys have uh issues with their technological literacy yes uh so another program that is considerably that's not all older but... is the cmc program that stands for cross-cultural ministry program that's actually out of concordia irvine which is over by me um, I have a CMC vicar at my church. And CCM? No, it's CMC. It's the Cross-Cultural Ministry Center. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but so how that works is you are you are a vicar at whatever church, I guess, is sponsoring you for the entirety of your program. And you take classes. Most of those classes are virtual. I, they do have you come in during the summer for, I think it's a few weeks or a couple weeks on campus for intensives. Um, and then the kind of the push of that program is your capstone is like some sort of ministry launch. It's supposed to be cross-cultural. It's supposed to kind of be, um, it's it's supposed to develop missional pastors is the goal of the CM, the stated goal of the CMC program. Um, so there's that that one is is really limited in its size uh kind of intentionally and um and also like it, you, uh, i don't know how they phrase it you you have to be cross cultural in some regard um and then the last kind of route at least at the time this podcast is being recorded is the SMP program, which is Specific Ministry Pastor Program. Um, and how that works, at least as it's kind of laid out in, in its purpose, is it is for guys who have served in the church for a long time, whether that is as a director of Christian education or as a teacher or even just as an elder. Like they've been in and around the church for a very long time. And they kind of, they, they want to be able to step into a role of just a little bit greater service. So they go through the SMP program, which is a, a it's a virtual program, just like the CMC, um, with the intensives during the summer. And I think they, I am pretty sure they have intensives during the winter too. And, yep. um, and they go through and they are ordained as specific ministry pastors. So like my dad did the program. And he uh, kind of a specific ministry pastor of youth ministry was kind of where that ended up. The thing with SMP pastors, all the, all the other routes, you, you end up with a, a full ordination, um, a general ordination, sorry. And you can be called anywhere. 
SMP, for them to receive a call at a church other than the one that sponsored them, um, the district presidents kind of, the two that are involved need to sign off on it, which is kind mm -hmm. of an extra step that you don't need with a general ordination. Um, and I don't think SMP pastors are allowed as representatives at conventions. Not as of yet, though. I think there might be a motion. I on think the... there are motions on the floor this summer to fix that. Um, yeah. But as it stands now, the... so those are the routes. It, there's one more that you didn't mention. Hold on. Hold on. Colloquy? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a pastor in another denomination, you essentially, it's like a, it's like a, an intense uh, gauntlet of some theological courses to make sure you're in the same place we are. And then they're like, okay, you're a Lutheran pastor now. Um, from what I don't know, I, I actually don't think I know anyone personally who's gone through the colloquy process. I have heard it is prohibitively expensive. I don't think it's that expensive. I think it's just prohibitively difficult. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Um, well, maybe not. Maybe it's not unfortunate. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. So is there a specific direction you wanted to go with this, Ben? Or because my thoughts are a little so, scattered on it. Sure. So I think, I mean, the easiest way to talk about this is kind of the pros and cons of each each system um and like there are certainly pros and cons of each of those systems um and if you're if you're okay with it i'd like to go in in reverse order of what we just like talked about um mostly because i have thoughts on colloquy and smp that i are freshest in my mind yeah go for uh, it so like to me, the co or the the pro of we're talking colloquy first, which is again like a uh, free agent pastor switchover kind of situation. Um, the the biggest pro is that like you get a pastor into a denomination that they align with. Um, because if they want to jump ship from one denomination to another, chances are that their confession doesn't fit whatever they're, whatever they're currently leaving. working in. Yeah. Um, I only know a couple of, of pastors in the LCMS uh, that colloquized over. Um, I know that there's, there's several, um, but I only know personally a couple of them. Um, but I know more that colloquized from the ELCA into some of the church bodies that split off from it. And for them, that was the biggest thing. It was, um, I read scripture and it didn't match what my church body was saying we needed to believe. And I needed to get out uh, because I wanted, I want to teach a, uh, a doctrine that I actually agree with um and not have you know church hierarchy coming down on me for upsetting the wrong people um and i think i saw a couple of years ago a, i don't think he went to the lcms but there's a baptist pastor i think in like mississippi or something that became an independent lutheran and uh it it was a whole thing in his congregation um <clears throat> some people followed him because they uh like understood where he was coming from saw his, his scriptural reasoning for making the changes he did but like it can really it can really rock a congregation um right. so like the biggest pro again it gets a pastor into a denomination that they actually align with the biggest con is that Oftentimes that comes with a fair amount of turmoil for whatever church or denomination or anything else that that pastor is leaving. Um, we talked, I mean, Josh and I both had um, a professor that colloquized over at the seminary 
Cyphered. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So there's a, a a scripture professor at the seminary. One of Mark the most Zyphred. gifted exegetical yeah. profs there. Oh yeah, brilliant, brilliant man. Man knows more about Greek than I will like. The man has forgotten more about Greek than I will ever know. Um, but uh, he grew up Lutheran, became a Baptist. Uh, I think at some point in his young adult life, um, became an incredible uh, teacher and professor within the uh, the Baptist world, and then um, had a change of heart and realized, I think there's more to this, like God being the one giving us grace thing than I gave it credit for in my younger days, and came back. Um, and the process to to get him back into the denomination was rigorous because uh, there is a fair amount of disagreement between the Baptist church and the Lutheran church. Uh, I know it ruffled some feathers on the Baptist end of things when he left uh, the seminary that he was at there. Um, and there are some people who are not entirely happy that he is teaching it at the seminary in St. Louis because well, the guy was a Baptist two years ago, or I guess it was like five years ago now. Um, so all of that is to say there can be a lot of of turmoil around a pastor switching denominations and jumping straight into a role um, in a different one. Now, uh, kind of a more, I guess, organizational pro and con. The pro is in a lot of these cases, you are getting someone who has some good practical experience, who does have, they have the skills necessary. Mm -hmm. And you're just, you're just having to make sure that their theology is where it needs to be, which is why it's so rigorous. Yeah. Um, to make sure that theology is in the same place. Yeah. There, there you a, there's an advantage here and you're getting, I mean, <laughs> you're getting if a pastor, which in case no one has told you and you're listening to this, there is a pastor shortage in the LCMS. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a pastor shortage in just about every denomination. Right. So when you get one, it's like, okay, this is, this is a good thing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's colloquy. Um, then the next one, and this is the one that's most contentious within our denomination is the SMP program. I only um, think it's the most contentious because it is more well-known than the CMC. That's possibly fair. Um, but the SMP program, like, so we talked about those three, um, like, requirements, a spiritual maturity, a, um, like, life maturity, and a um, knowledge know. maturity. Yeah. Um, the... Colloquy guys, you're expecting they're coming in with a spiritual maturity and a life maturity if they're if they've already been a pastor. Um, that's not always the case, and sometimes you need to check on those things, obviously. But um, for them, it's the the knowledge base that our our denomination is most concerned about. On the S and P side of things, uh, it's very much the same, except instead of stepping from a um a pastoral role in another church they're stepping from a different auxiliary leadership role in a church into the pastoral role um and so a lot of the the colloquy guys um end up taking smp theology classes um because it's a very very similar like yeah, conceptually it's it's very similar and yeah. I want to speak, and I'm biased because my dad went through the SMP program, mm -hmm. but I want to speak in its in kind of in its favor. I think the SMP program is excellent when it is used for what it is intended for. Yeah. Okay. So you have a guy who's been in a church for decades, who serves faithfully. They they will have been formed spiritually, being a leader in in church or in a church or in churches for so long and they have the life so they their character doesn't need nearly as much formation um they just need some of those academic things right um 
So I think the SMP program is phenomenal. You're giving them the academics because you're giving them those classes. They have been formed and, and you're putting out pastors who are well-equipped to fill that role. I think the issue that sometimes comes up with the SMP is when guys use it. Um, I, <laughs> this is where we might start stepping on some toes. When guys use it as a way to avoid the residential program. Okay, they're, this is this program is not designed for people who are Ben in my age. That's not what it's intended for because the reality is when we were coming out of undergrad, we needed the spiritual formation. We And I mean, we still do, right? We're still growing in the spiritual formation and the life formation. Um, and the residential program does an incredible job doing that. So if you are if you use the SMP just as a way to not have to go to St. Louis for four years, I don't think it does enough, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it does, it's not designed to take on the spiritual and the life formation. It's designed to hone those with the intellectual, the academic formation. So as far as I'm concerned, for whatever that is worth, right? The, the SMP program is excellent at for what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. if you, and like, it's, it's like anything can be a hammer if you try hard enough, but really a hammer is good at hammering nails and you should use your stable to, stapler to staple papers. Yes. <laughs> or, or your phone. Um, Why are you stapling your phone? No, you, you should use your phone to be a phone, not a hammer. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I think there used to be an age requirement if it might've just been a guideline, but I think there used to be an age requirement around SMP uh, pastoring, um, which kind of lended itself towards people having some of that church experience. Um, I don't know what happened to that or if that was just a figment of my imagination, but. I'm going um, to look it up quick. Another thing that, like to speak to what the SMP program was designed for, like there is such a pastor shortage in our denomination that um, a handful of districts kind of took it on themselves to start um, not ordaining, what's the commissioning, what they called licensed lay deacons, um, which were very similarly guys with a lot of, of uh, church life experience um, that would get some training from their district or from a seminary. And the, uh, the district president would just like, you know, tap them on the head and say, all right, you're, you're good to essentially fill all of the roles and duties of a pastor. Um, but you're not a pastor. And there were a lot of people that had issue with that. And I think fairly because there's, there's some not inconsistency nearly, there, right? Yeah, there's a lot of inconsistency. You're saying we're making there's guys do all this to do the pastor thing. Yeah. And then you say, eh, but we're going to let these guys do the pastor thing anyway. And in, in everything yeah. but name, it's like, well, if we need to do was, all that stuff or not. <laughs> yeah. The bigger thing was that there just wasn't the kind of oversight. Um, like their training was often kind of slapdash. Um, I don't mean that to say that it wasn't rigorous. It was, but like they'd kind of get it on the fly and it would be done very, very quickly so that they could just get someone installed and, and serving. And so the SMP program was then created to help fill that same need. Um, and especially for communities that uh, couldn't afford a full-time pastor, this was a way to get a guy through seminary cheaply. Um, so a lot of the SMP guys, I think it's something like, I'm pretty sure it's more than 50% of the SMP guys are um, bivocational or have another job outside of being a pastor. Uh, and they serve relatively small congregations. Um, and a lot of them are also the ones that aren't necessarily in that position. If 
find themselves in a position like Josh's dad, where they're filling a specific role within a church that they wanted to have a pastor in, but it would have been very difficult for them to get a pastor into. But they had a guy that, according to 1 Timothy, Timothy 3, was qualified to be a pastor, um, but just didn't have the qualifications in terms of the knowledge base or the, the education. And so this got him up to yeah. up to snuff on that. So again, it was meant to fill a need, and it is great at filling that need when that need is actually the need that when when it's used as intended. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to jump to. Can we jump to the CMC and then I have? Can I give I you one more thought on, on this? Some of the things you said. I'm going to give you one more thought on this first. Okay. Go um, for it. So. The one thing that the SMP has that's kind of a drawback, it's meant to kind of dissuade people from doing it, um, is that if you finish the program, you're not supposed to be able to take a call. Josh talked about this. There, I think there's a bit of a movement, and I don't, I can't remember if there's actually a motion on this uh, or not, but there's been a bit of a movement to um, let years of service kind of amplify the pastoral training that SMP guys receive. And after a certain number of years, they perhaps be able to receive another call uh, if that worked out. Um, and again, like if we're talking about all of this in terms of the quality and quantity of formation that people get, um, some of that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and but that's not a system that's currently in place. And, and so there's a whole bunch of like, and I, I do want to throw out there, if you are in a district where they approve, like where generally we they appreciate the SMP pastor, and you're moving within that district or you're moving to another district where they are of that same attitude, where they're okay with the SMP program, you can take another call, right? Because the district presidents are going to clear that. Mm -hmm. It's... It's if you are an SMP pastor and for whatever reason you are, uh, they're trying to call you to a district that looks less kindly on the program, that's when you're going to run into trouble. Okay. Um, so the SMP program, I would advocate if you are, if you're listening to this and you've been in the church for a long time, you're, you're serving as an elder or in some other role and you're like, I, and, and you feel and you have that call and you're like, I, I could serve as a pastor. Look into the SMP program because it is you are the person it's designed for. And I, I think it is a good program, again, when used as intended. Um, the CMC program is different in that when you're done with it, there is a full ordination. Um, and as far as pros and cons. I think I got to choose my words carefully here. I mean, again, it's meant to fill a need. Like we can't deny that the LCMS is an incredibly uh, Germanic or European denomination. Like uh, I think last I checked 95 or 94% of LCMS members were white. Um, the majority of the rest are, well, I shouldn't say the majority of the rest because I think the numbers have changed a little bit, but then it's kind of a mix of, of everything else from there. Um, but the CMC program was largely created along with the uh, Center for Hispanic Studies that exists at, at the St. Louis Seminary to fulfill the need in immigrant populations. Um, and then also in some other niche populations like the deaf community, um, I think there's one guy that went through the CMC program who just happens to live in like Portland or something and wanted to do ministry amongst atheists. Um, and so like it, it, again, it fills a need. Right. So the, the big pro of the program is it's focused on building up missional pastors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, from from where I sit, the con is that 
it doesn't spend a whole lot of time on the spiritual and the life formation. It does a lot there, of there's... academics and kind of just says, go do mission mm -hmm. without forming those different kinds of maturity, at least mm -hmm. not intentionally. And, it, and that is from what I've seen, right? I'm kind of a, a third party in my experience with the SM, the CMC. Yeah, from what I, from what I've seen, I mean, you've got a CMC vicar, so you know more about this than I do, but um, I've known a couple in my, my experience, my high school janitor actually went through the CMC program um, when I was there. So he got ordained, I think my senior year of high school. Um, but uh, he had an overseeing pastor um, who was in charge of leading him through his spiritual and life formation. And the guy that, uh, that worked with him, uh, I think did an incredible job of that, but it is a lot to ask of those pastors to, to fulfill the, the role of like the entire seminary community um, in terms of life and, and spiritual formation um, for a, a pastor. Um, and that, like in certain cases where you've already got a pretty spiritually and life mature guy, the CMC program can be a great plus. If you've got somebody that needs a lot of work, um, it can kind of feel like you're shoving something through just to meet a quota. Yeah. Um, which I think in some cases can maybe be said of the SMP program as well, right? It's, mm -hmm. um, you, you got to use them as intended. And for both of those programs, in reality, if the guy is ready to be a pastor when he goes into the program, he will be fine. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't come into the program ready to be a pastor, uh, he, he's the program's probably not going to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, which gets to, gets to what I want to lead into our discussion of the residential with. And we're both probably biased because this is the program we went through. Um, however, in my experience with the residential program, the formation that comes from being in that community for three, call it three years, because the one year you're out on Vicarage, you cannot replicate that virtually. Okay. So for anyone who is not already in a spiritual and, and, uh, and life maturity place, they need to go through the residential program, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there, there are voices in our, in our synod who would like to see more distance learning options available, open up to get people into ministry. And I do not think that is wise because, and, and they say, you know, for guys, it's so hard for them to move to St. Louis and to do all this. And I, I, and my response to that is what are, what do you think you're preparing them for? Right. Pastoral ministry is not easy. Pastoral ministry constantly is asking for personal sacrifice. If you can't move to St. Louis for a few years, if you can't make that sacrifice, then I don't know if you're ready for, for ministry in this, in this kind of way, right? Um, so that's one of my things is, like I said, I'm a big fan of, of programs like the SMP who take guys who are formed and they have the character and they have the spiritual maturity. And it just gives them that extra little bit of academic knowledge to reach that place where we want our pastors to be. But for those who are saying we need a distance program, no, I, for what we're preparing guys for, I, I don't think that's, the, that's a good way to go about this. Because I will tell you, in my years at the seminary, I was formed more to be a pastor by the community there, by the people I spent time with, by by all of the meals I shared with guys where we were talking through stuff and we were discussing issues and we were talking about ministry 
Um, even just like the time after we'd play pickup soccer and then we'd sit at the picnic tables for a while and talk about different church things like that formation more than anything from the classroom is what has shaped me. And my contention is you cannot at <laughs> right now, I, I don't want to speak for future technology, but right now you cannot replace that virtually because any, and I, I made this contention in one of my classes, um, my doctoral classes, who the professor is a big fan of virtual discipleship. And I said, anything virtual is by nature curated and you cannot have authentic community when everything is curated, when I'm only showing you what I want you to see. Um, because like, I'll be honest, I remember vividly a conversation I had with some of our brothers at the seminary. Um, we had gotten into a bad habit. We would meet for lunch and we would gossip. We, we would talk about professors. We would talk about other students sometimes. And like, we had a come to Jesus moment where like, we should not be doing this. This is inappropriate. And it was something we had to reckon with together. And it was a sin that we had to deal with. And you're not going to have the opportunity to do that virtually. Um, and my my thought with kind of, and I'm going to finish this rant in a second, I swear. Um, I worked at Vandy Radio and my first year at Vanderbilt, um, I was selected as the training director and it was the radio station's first year as a radio station. So we were desperate for on-air hosts. And we basically said, if you want to be a host, we'll give you a show. And training was like, maybe an hour and we said okay you're good to go and we ended the year uh i think with eight hosts or 12 hosts and most of them were on like the director team um and the the some of the hosts we had they were they were bad and a lot of people just dropped the second year i i was a little i had a little more firm footing I was still the training director. And I said, uh, no, we're, we have a rigorous program. You're going to shadow people for, you're going to shadow an existing host for a whole semester. You're going to go through all this material. We're, we're going to test you on some of the stuff like the FCC requirements and stuff like that. Um, it was a lot more work to become a host. And we added 50 hosts that semester. And my, my statement here is, in our desperation to fill pulpits, we should not lower our standards. If anything, we should make them higher. And this is something when we got an email from the synod saying like, how can we support you guys in recruiting more pastors? And my statement was this, put out excellent men and excellent pastors who other people will look up to. That is how we fill this problem, this shortage of pastors. It's not, don't make it easier to become a pastor. Make being a pastor is something that you look to guys and you say, it is worth going through all of that work to be like him. That is how you fix it. Because the residential and kind of segueing into the residential program, the residential program is hard. Uh, we, by credit hour, LCMS pastors are the most well-educated pastors. I think we're just top five. I don't just think we're top five. We're top five, but I don't think we're number one. Um, I think the Catholics are number one, but you're right. Other than the, well, yeah. Anyway, so we are very well educated. You, you have to take three years of, of master's level theology courses, essentially. Um, it is not, and, and you do have to move to St. Louis and you, most guys have to move again for Vicarage and then you have to move back to St. Louis and then you move somewhere like it's a lot, especially if you have family, it's a lot, but <laughs> It's worth it. I think the pros of the residential program are that community formation that you cannot replace. You can't simulate that. Um, and, and I think the major con is, yes, it's inconvenient. But you know what? <laughs> so are a lot of parts of pastoral ministry. There's my, there's my rant. There's all my notes that I made to myself. What do you think, Ben? I... I'll I'll tend to to generally agree with you on the on like the the residential route. I think like hypothetically, 
it is the most well-rounded in terms of <clears throat> an ability to pump out good pastors. Um, I know of <clears throat> multiple circumstances where um, guys were delayed for a year in their ordination uh, in order to help them work on uh, social skills or spiritual life issues, um, you know, all sorts of things. Because the the professors, the the pastors, the other colleagues and students that were there with those people identified those things as, hey, if this guy wants to be a pastor, we need him to grow in this area. Um, and for the most part, if you're already willing to be there for four years, an extra year to work on something that makes you a better and more capable pastor is usually something that people are willing to do. That being said, I do think it's possible uh, for people to put their head down and kind of skate through uh, and escape seminary without really facing some of those formational aspects. So it is not a perfect system. Right. Um, and if you have somebody in your life that you are trying to encourage to get into uh, to seminary, to get into some sort of pastoral training program, um, it's good for you as the person encouraging them to put that word in their ear, to put that like worm in their ear off the bat. This is going to be tough. They're going to say things about you that you don't like in terms of like ways that you need to grow, ways that you need to be formed. Um, but you have to actually do those things. Right. You yeah. can't just. You have to go in with an attitude. This place is going to form me to be yes. a better pastor. Not yeah. as these are boxes I have to check. Yeah. I. It's so funny to me thinking back to our first year, like, there were all of the, um, we had a lot of classmates who did pre-seminary programs at, at the Concordias, and uh, they had a greater than average likelihood to be a little bit conceited about their uh, status on the campus, um, like a little bit golden chosen uh, kind of mentality. And it was so refreshing to me to to walk into some of our first like practical and pastoral classes and just hear from professors. Um, like you are not special. We are here to form you to be an instrument for God. It is not you. It is not your gifts. It is not your talents and abilities, simply the things that God has given to you to bless him. And so if you come into the, the, the residential route with that attitude, you're going to do great. If you come into it with an attitude of, I want to be a good pastor for me, you're not, you're going to fall flat on your face and it's going to be ugly. Um, that's all I got to say about it. And we're running out of time. So should we jump to takeaways here quick, Josh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my takeaway is we should take pastoral formation very seriously. And guys who are walking through it should always be looking for opportunities to improve and to become excellent men and excellent pastors. That includes but, pastors in the world. Yes. Um, because of the role we fill it's not right for us to give it anything less than that. What about you, Ben? Takeaway. Um, I think my big takeaway is A, we need more pastors, but B, it doesn't mean we're taking everyone. Um, and don't go because you think, oh, this might be interesting. Um, don't send someone because you think that they're intelligent um, and nice. 
uh, if there is, if you or someone you know is is someone that you think is a strong candidate for pastoral ministry, um, really explore that situation. Um, there's a a guy just up the road from me who's a director of family life who is exploring seminary um, starting fall of 24. And uh, in preparation for that, he's had conversations with a handful of pastors in the area, uh, myself included. He went to the seminary in St. Louis and toured. Um, he has done a bunch of prayer and, and discernment on this. Um, and I don't know exactly what his thought is at this point. I think he's leaning towards going, but I know he's put in the work to make sure that this is the right decision for him. Uh, and so if, if, like I said, if that's you, or if that's someone that, you know, make sure that they put in the work to discern that this is the right call before they even get there. Uh, Cause that will better set them up for being formed to be the pastor that, that God needs them to be. Yeah. So this, this part, and we mentioned this earlier, but if you have someone in your life who is considering ministry, uh, pastoral ministry, or if you think they should be, send them this podcast. And if you, if you were sent this podcast uh, and they didn't tell you why, it's because they think you should be, you should be thinking about this. You should be praying about this. Um, in any case, we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week, maybe. Definitely within the next couple of weeks, um, we'll, we'll be back in 1 Corinthians. So make sure to subscribe uh, on whatever platform you, you prefer to listen on. We're on Pandora, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora. I think I already said Pandora. Anyway, uh, subscribe. We appreciate it. It lets us know that people are listening and it's worth taking the time to do this. And uh, if you have a topic you want us to talk about, if you have a guest you want us to have on, if you want to come on as a guest, just let us know. If you know us personally, you can reach out. We're fine with that. Send us a text, a little texty text. Um, if you don't know us personally and you just stumbled across this podcast, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we do have a Facebook page, Man Buns and Jesus. You can message there. We'll get that message at some point um, and, and we'll respond because that's you can like the Facebook page if you want, but it's mostly there. So if you don't know us, you can still reach out. With all of that said, uh, it's been a blessing being with you guys today. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.